If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 6. Uh, listen as I read. For a while we were still helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were sinners, well, if, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Well, these verses, they show us the hopeless condition that we were in before God saved us. And they also demonstrate what a tremendous love that God has for us. And there's three phrases that really stand out in these verses. The first one, number one, while we were still helpless. The second one, while we were yet sinners. And the third one, while we were enemies. And God demonstrated his love for us while we were helpless, while we were yet sinners, and even while we were enemies. That's what the Bible teaches. And he did it at great cost. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins that we might be saved. And so tonight, let's, <clears throat> let's look at each of these three phrases and, and see how they show us the, the tremendous love that God has for his people. So the first phrase is, while we were still helpless. Romans 5, 6 says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still helpless, that's when Christ died for us. The Bible teaches us that we are helpless as far as our salvation is concerned. We can't do anything on our own to procure our salvation. We've all sinned and we've all fall short of God's glorious standards. In Romans three twenty three, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible teaches us that the just consequence of our sin is, is death. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And when a sinner dies in their sins, they're lost. Matthew 10.28 says, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so the consequences of sin are death and hell. The consequences of sin are very fearful. But how can we avoid these consequences? Because we're born as sinners. Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And so we were born in sin. We naturally sin. We're naturally bent on destruction. Our default setting is to run away from God and towards sin and death and hell. That's the state of man without Christ. And we're helpless on our own to do anything about it. We are helpless on our own when it comes to changing the situation. We, we can't even on our own come to Christ. John 6, says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. But Romans 5, 6 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So Christ died for us while we were in this helpless state. Without Christ, we have no strength or ability to change our natural bent towards sin. Without Christ, we have no ability to move towards God. Without Christ, we're lost and without hope, and we're helpless to do anything about it. Let, let me show you just how helpless the Bible says man really is in the matter of salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And so the Bible teaches us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, not, not wounded, not sick, not hurt, but dead. Absolutely dead. You and I were dead, spiritually dead, in our trespasses, in our sins. We were enslaved to sin. We, we followed the course of this world according to the power of Satan. And the Bible says we were helpless to do anything about it. After all, how can a dead person help himself? He, he can't. A physically dead person is unable to do anything for himself. He doesn't move. He doesn't breathe. He doesn't think. He is absolutely dead, unable to do anything to help himself at all. Spiritually dead person is the same way. He's unable to do anything for himself in the matter of salvation. 
absolutely helpless. But Romans 5, 6 says, for a while we were still helpless. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And so consider this, while, while we were helpless, while we were lost and without hope, while we were enslaved to sin, while we were bent on a course to hell, while we were dead in our sins and utterly unable to do anything about it, the Bible says Christ died for us. And so Christian, you are a Christian now because Christ died for you when you were helpless. When you were helpless. God took pity on you when you couldn't do anything to help yourself. He saw you headed to hell. He saw the misery that you were in and the helpless state you were in. And he took compassion on you. God sent his son Jesus to die for your sins and that, that you could be saved. And he did it when you were helpless. He did it when I was helpless. And we were dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses. He did it because of his great love for us. John 3, 16, everyone knows this verse, probably almost everyone who's a Christian anyway. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God loves the world. Romans 5, 6, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So God showed his tremendous love for us by sending his own son to die for us when we were helpless and lost. But the Bible says more. Let's look at that second phrase in our text, which says God demonstrated his love towards us while we were yet sinners. If you look at Romans 5, 7, it says, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does this statement mean? Well, well, listen carefully. Even as Christians, we're still sinners. Amen? Even as Christians, we're still sinners. We're, we're repentant sinners, but we're still sinners. We're saints who still sin and wish we didn't. As Christians, we're in a daily battle with the sinful flesh. And though we often have victory, many times we still lose. There's a war going on inside of a Christian. In Galatians 5:17, it says, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Christian, the sinful flesh in you sets its desire against the spirit of God in you. And the spirit of God in you sets its desire against the sinful flesh that's in you. There's a war going, going on inside of the Christian. And I think anyone who's a Christian knows this by experience. You feel it inside. You know what's going on. Though, we're now call, no, though we are now called saints, we're still sinners. And, and we're called to deny our sinful flesh every, every single day and follow Jesus. Luke 9.23 says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so we must deliberately take up the battle against our sinful flesh every single day. Even as Christians, we're still sinners. But... I say all that to say that's not what this verse is talking about. That's not what this verse is talking about. When it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, this verse is talking about us before we were saved. This verse is talking about us as unrepentant sinners before we came to Christ. This text is talking about practicing sinners, deliberate sinners, intentional sinners, sinners choosing to be sinners with no intention of changing, this text is talking about sinners going into sin with deliberation and purpose and with intention of going, of going that way. This verse is talking about sinners who do not desire God or godliness or holiness or reform or repentance. When the Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's, talk, it's talking about God demonstrating his love towards sinners who have not come to Christ. Sinners who are choosing their sinful ways, not fighting their sinful ways. It's talking about sinners who love their sin and reject God. Sinners who sin without any regard towards offending a holy God at all. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners in an intentional, unrepentant manner, with no desire or intention to serve or please God whatsoever, or have anything to do with him, that's when God showed his tremendous love for us by sending Jesus to die for our sins. Romans 5, 7 says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's hard to even imagine a person dying for a righteous man, though the Bible says 
For a good man, someone might dare to die, but God demonstrated his love toward us. Christ died for us, not when we were good, not when we were righteous, but when we were yet unrepentant sinners, deliberate and intentional sinners, wicked and evil sinners who engaged in our sin with purpose and determination, sinners who didn't care about offending God, sinners who delighted in their sin, couldn't get enough of their sin, went back for more, and sinners who could care less about what God thought of it. Christian, that's the kind of sinners that we were before God saved us. We were very offensive to God. Romans 1, through 32 describes the kind of sinners that we were when Christ died for us. Romans 1, says, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That's the state that we were in when Jesus died for us. That's where we were when Jesus died for us. He paid the price that we owed for our sins. He died for our sins when we were yet sinners. Listen to the prayer that Jesus prayed while he was on the cross. In Luke 23, it says, When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus was looking out at these sinners, these lost people, the very people who were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus was looking out at the people who put him on the cross and, and nailed his hands and feet to the cross. And he prayed to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And though you and I weren't there in person, it was our sins that put Jesus on that cross just as much as their sins. And Jesus was also praying for us, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Romans 5, 7 says, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christian, if you've ever doubted God's love, love for you, you can stop. Jesus died for you while you were yet a sinner, while you were yet an unrepentant sinner. Jesus died for you when you had your back turned against him. He died for you when you were following the course of this world, when you were practicing deliberate, intentional, unrepentant, wicked sin, when you were someone who had no regard for him whatsoever. That's when God showed his love to you and to me by sending Jesus to die for us. Romans 5, 9, much more than having, <clears throat> Romans 5, 9 says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Uh, that next verse, Romans 5, 9, this verse is saying that if God loved us while we were yet sinners, if God sent his son to die for us while we were yet sinners, how much more should we be saved from the wrath of God to come now that we are his children, now that we are justified through the blood of Christ? Let me read that again, Romans 5, 9. Much more than, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. We were unrepentant sinners, Christ died for us in that state. Now we're justified saints. If God loved us so much when we were unrepentant sinners, how much more now? How much more now? When we, how much more shall he surely save us from the wrath to come now that we're his beloved children? Christian, think about it. When we were yet sinners, God loved us so much that he sent his son to the cross to die for us. Now we're saved. Now we belong to him. Now we're justified. Now we stand before him in the righteousness of Christ. How much more then shall we be saved from the wrath to come? Think about that. Isn't the love of God amazing? He died for us while we were yet sinners. Now we're his children. How much more will we be saved? 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's one more phrase in this text that we need to look at. The third phrase we need to look at is this, while we were enemies, while we were enemies. The Bible goes so far as to say that God demonstrated his love towards us while we were enemies. He showed us his love while we were helpless. He showed us his love while we were yet unrepentant sinners, but God didn't stop there. He even showed us his love while 
by sending his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for our enemies. Romans 5.10 says it this way, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. While we were enemies, God sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Now this raises a question. When the Bible says while we were enemies, does it mean that we saw God as our enemy? Or does it mean that God saw us as his enemy? Which way is it? You ever thought about that? Either way, it sounds bad. The, the, the truth is, the Bible would support either interpretation. When we were not saved, when we were unrepentant sinners in rebellion against God, God, God clearly saw us as rebels. He saw us as his enemies. We were defiant against his holy commands, willful sinners in the face of God's holiness. We had made ourselves into his enemies, and we were in a very real danger of suffering the terrible wrath he reserves for his enemies. Romans 2.5 says, but no, you won't listen. So you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself because of your stubbornness in refusing to turn from your sin. For there's going to come a day of judgment when God, the just judge of all the world, will judge all people according to what they've done. So God sees repentant sinners who refuse to turn to Christ. And he does see them as his enemies. That's what the Bible says. In Hebrews 1.13, it says, God, God says to his son, Jesus Christ, sit in honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies making them a footstool under your feet. So our verse can refer to God seeing unrepentant sinners as his enemies, but it can also mean that unrepentant sinners see God as their enemy. In Philippians 3.18, it says, For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there's many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. And so people can show by their conduct that they see God as an enemy. In Romans 8, 7, it says, For the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. The Bible says when a person's mind is set on the flesh, that is the mindset of an unsaved person, he is naturally hostile towards God. And so the unsaved person looks at God as his enemy. What a terrible situation to be so rebellious against God <clears throat> that our mind is hostile towards him and sees him as an enemy, the one who created us. <clears throat> and what a terrible situation to be in, to live in such a sinful, rebellious state that God would hold us rightly under his wrath and call us his enemy. That's a fearful thing. <clears throat> but God did something even in this terrible situation. Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God saw us as enemies. We were his enemy. He was our enemy. God chose to love us in this terrible state, a state where he could have just as rightly thrust us into hell. He loved us in this alienated, hostile state and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this world to die on the cross for our wickedness and for our sins, that we might be reconciled, that we could be saved. And that is a love beyond amazing. It's a, I, I can't really describe that love, just to, other than to say God's love is beyond amazing. And so Christian, don't ever doubt in the love that God has for you. He sent his son to die for you while you were his enemy. Again, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now look at that last phrase. It says, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What does that phrase even mean? Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Well, Jesus is alive in heaven right now. And he's interceding on our behalf before the Father as our great high priest. Jesus loves us and he intercedes for us in prayer. That's what the Bible teaches to our Father who loves us. If God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins when we were his enemies, how much more now when we are reconciled to God, when we are friends of God, when we are the children of God, how much more now shall we be saved when Christ himself who died for us now lives before the throne of God at the right hand of God interceding for us? as our Lord and Savior. Think about that. Christ himself is interceding for you. We, we shall be saved not only by his death, but by his life, his resurrected life in heaven as our great high priest. So let me, let me conclude. Listen to this last verse, Romans 5.11, in the New Living Translation. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in making us friends of God. 
Christian, the love of God is something we ought to really rejoice in. God loved us when we were helpless. He loved us when we were sinners. And he even loved us when we were his enemies. He demonstrated this love so clearly and so tangibly. He showed us his great love by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins and make us right with himself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. But I, 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 want to, uh, I want to read to you a benediction. And so here's the benediction from Ephesians 3.16. I, I, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will give you mighty inner strength through his Holy Spirit. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his, really, his love really is. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great you'll never fully understand it. Then you'll be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now glory be to God by his mighty power at work within us. He's able to accomplish infinitely more than we would ever dare to ask or hope. May he be given glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever through endless ages. Amen.